Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And one of the things I love about TED is that it's the power of ideas. And Walt Roberts, who was my mentor and the founder of the National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder, he's told me when I was 22 years old, the power of an idea is to give it to someone else. And um, today, um, I think having this kind of a, a venue and event uh, just shows how far we've come with this kind of idea that was really his idea many, many years ago. So tonight, I want to talk a little bit about how trends are formed and how patterns become trends and how you can profit from them. I can't tell you what I've created because I'm not allowed to say they would kill me if I did. But there's some key points I want to make. The first one is patterns are segments that when combined make major trends. Knowing patterns and the resulting trends are key to forecasting the future and that's really what I've been interested in. And if you can forecast the future with positive skill, it can be lucrative, very lucrative. So I know this is going to seem hard because I look so young, but I've been forecasting for 50 years, uh, more than 50. And it all started years ago in 1954 when a major hurricane hit the East Coast named Carol. I don't know if any of you were around then or have ever read about it, but at the time it was the biggest hurricane since one that hit in 1938. And it hit when I was five years old and I remember watching the trees blow down and part of the roof of our house blew off and there was a tidal wave that came up Narragansett Bay into Providence and uh, the city was inundated with lots of water. <coughs> and at five years old I thought, wow, what was that? So from then on I knew at some point I was going to be a meteorologist and I started studying weather patterns. By the time I got to college, I knew more than most of the people who were there about weather patterns. Then I went to the National Center for Atmospheric Research and I worked on the first Cray supercomputer and in 1984 came out, not my, just myself, but with all the scientists at NCAR, with the first global climate warming predictions and now we know uh, what's happening to our Earth. So it's given me the basis to look at patterns in many other areas. And in the 90s, uh, we were thinking that location-based services were going to be important services in the 2000s. And we wrote a report about how satellite data might change the way we think of geo-positioning ourselves and that was part of the formation of Digital Globe, which is now a New York exchange, stock exchange listed company. Um, and I also helped a little bit at the beginning of SpaceX, which are the commercial launch vehicles now that, repa uh, uh, that replace the space shuttle and um, bringing all the crews and, and um, um, all the stuff that's needed for the International State, uh, Space Station. One of my heroes when I was studying mathematics in college was a good old Italian boy. I'm half Italian. And my better half, actually. Um, and his middle name is Paisano. And in Italian, Paisano means friend. So I want you to remember that. But he was a 12th century a uh, mathematician, and he discovered the sequence. It wasn't the original trend, but it was a, a mathematical representation of patterns that are so common in nature. So I want to show you what the sequence looks like. It starts with zero. By the way, that's my addition to it because it really doesn't start with zero, but for the sake of this, I wanted to make it easy to understand, so if you take zero and add it to one, you get one, and if you take one and add it to the number to the left, 
it becomes 2, and 2 plus 1 is 3, and 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, etc. Please look at the numbers 55, 89, 144, and 233. They have unique characteristics, and actually all the Fibonacci numbers do. If you divide one by the other, no matter which number it is, once you get out to this part of the sequence, you always get the same result, 1.618 or 0.618. And these ratios then repeat over and over again. So if I take a line segment that's this long and I break it down into two pieces, and the first one is 61.8%, leaving 0.382 or 38.2% for this one. And I keep successively breaking them down into 0 0.618, 0 0.382, 0 0.618, 0 0.382. And then I take a protractor to the middle of those squares and I draw an arc that subtends the outside of the square. You get the spiral. And this really is a very, very interesting pattern. Why is that? Well, let's take a look, hopefully. Spiral patterns is how, are how nature behaves. That's a spiral galaxy. That's a fern coming out of the ground. Some of you may remember Paula Zahn. She was the anchor of CBS News and had this perfect face. And if you broke it down, all of her ratios were Fibonacci ratios. <laughs> I want you to remember this one because this is DNA, human DNA. It is also a Fibonacci spiral. We'll get back to that in just a second. A sunflower, your finger. Every digit is related to the next one by the ratio of 1.618. Cauliflower, my favorite vegetable. <laughs> a seashell. And, of course, I saved the best for last. Hurricane Sandy. Okay. This was the biggest hurricane that hit the East Coast since 1954, the one that got me going on patterns. And when it hit the coast, I was just amazed at how exactly accurate the Fibonacci sequence and the golden spiral is in nature. So the Greeks must have known this because look at the Parthenon. It's broken down oops, into a perfect Fibonacci ratio. So if you look at the eaves, for example, you can see how even in here it's broken down in here and how each piece goes right through the Fibonacci ratios. Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci, painted her in Fibonacci perspective, and that's why her face is the most perfect of all. So let's get into patterns now. Patterns are made up of segments. This is a segment I drew for you. Segment number one is one. Segment number three is 1.618 of one, and seg seg segment number five is one. And this is how progress is made. If you think of the, the forward movement of mankind, it's always been lumpy. We've had the Dark Ages followed by the Renaissance. We've had the Industrial Revolution followed by the Civil War. So this is an important segment. Now, it would be great if our markets, say stock markets, for example, moved in this perfect sequence, but they're very, very noisy, so they're hard to see these patterns. And no two patterns are never exactly the same. However, observing these repeating patterns and knowing how they work in can increase forecasting skill and accuracy. So I want to show you what stringing patterns together looks like to make trends. So we've been in a bull market in the stock market, much to the chagrin of most people, who never thought it would be possible in such an economic environment. 
but it has happened. And you can see the five pattern, and then three that correct the pattern, followed by five more. That's a bull market. What's a bear market? Is simply turning it around, and I didn't even change the numbers because they're exactly the same pattern in reverse. So as we go forward, there are other things to consider. For instance, this is Kenya, the population of Kenya. This is a pyramid, and in this pyramid it shows the um, percent of men and women, and the young to the very old. And it looks sort of like a pyramid. And this is a very productive pyramid for economic growth. Let's look, it's the, and the reason for that really is because there's lots of young people to support the old people, and there's lots of young people that need lots of things. They want houses and cars and have families and all of these things. In the United States, we have a slow growth economy, and that's because people like me are right there. See that bulge? That's the baby boomers, the 90 million strong. And the next generation below us is only 70 million. So there's lots of unused demand for things that we're trying to sell and there's not enough people to buy them. That's one of the reasons that we have a slow economy. So if you look at the big three, the United States, China, in Japan, you'll see a very similar thing. But our hope now is that you guys, the generation of millennials, as you coming up, will replace the demand. And in the 2020s, we could have a booming economy here in the United States again. But it's going to take some time for us to get there. China, who was supposed to take over the world, is in much worse condition their generation now is getting older, and they have a very weak next generation coming. It's only five years wide. Part of it because of some of their policies on birth rates, et cetera. In Japan, look at this. It's a very old population, not very many young people. They were supposed to take over the world economically, too, and it didn't happen. And that's the reason it didn't happen. So let's get back. First of all, I want to say, I noticed tonight we had S Sam uh, Soley, Rick Raddatz, and now we have Bob Bunting. <laughs> That's a Fibonacci three. <laughs> but now let's talk about human being. Now back to the DNA, right? We're all Fibonacci sequences in some related form. And fear and greed are two human emotions that are really important. And in the stock market, you see fear and greed all the time. But I figured out that fear is about three times that of greed. And that's why bull markets are slowly rising and crashes are so fast. Because fear is a survival mode. Greed is sort of when you're at the top of the pyramid. You can be greedy. When there's fire in a theater and there's only one door, there's a stampede for the exit. And that happens during stock market crashes. So fear and greed are important components of trend. So this is great, but why am I so passionate about it? Well, I love forecasting. And if you're going to forecast something well, you have to understand how patterns become trends. And if they can be predicted with skill, it can be a very lucrative thing. So I don't want you to be alarmed with this, but I, and bear with me. I realize I'm the Fibonacci eighth speaker tonight. <laughs> so here's the S&P 500 forecast that I made for um, my subscribers on April Fool's Day last year, and this is no joke. <laughs> so what I, this is what's published in my letter, and basically, this is October of 2011, and the pattern had revealed itself to this point, April 1st. Because it was this pattern, and we were already in a bull market, 
These are the Fibonacci numbers that were in place at that moment. And I forecast the market would go down and then up and hit a high in late 2012 or, or early 2013. Last week, the S&P hit a new time record high at 1597. And so this pattern has evolved almost exactly as predicted. And look at this five here. Now look at this. Here's the bottom. Here's one, two, three, four, five. These patterns repeat themselves in time and scale. Had you followed these patterns since 2000, you a $100,000 investment would have grown to 320000 now with only five trend changes, that is, in 13 years. Five and 13 Fibonacci numbers. The difference between the two is a Fibonacci number. Is it over? I think I can predict that. So here's the deal since 2000. A top, a bottom. Another exact same top, a bottom. And now another exact same top within a few points and the market's trending down a little bit. Will we get a Fibonacci three bottom in 2015 or 16? So to sum it up, patterns become trends because they repeat. Patterns and trends are extremely chaotic, but most are predictable, except of course for black swan events. And if you have positive skill in predicting these trends, they're highly prof can be highly profitable. So trends occur over all time and space scales. The trend is your paisano until it ends. Thank you.